this pile of cash is in the coffers of IMF and World Bank, whereas this pile of coins is in the coffers of African countries, it's not enough to meet their budget needs to build roads, hospitals and schools. So IMF and World Bank dangle some of these notes and tell African presidents in a patronizing voice, guys, clearly, those coins of yours are not helping you. These notes can be used, but first of all, you have to meet some terms and conditions. First, uh, how impressed we are by the progress you have made on reforms. Reforms sometimes may be short-term painful, but they always make an economy more vibrant. Because they think that their economies will collapse without these notes, African presidents commit to those terms and conditions. They get the notes and life goes on. But remember, these notes, they are loans, not grants. African countries must pay the loans with interest. Circle the word interest. This interest adds to the coffers of IMF and World Bank. So they end up with even more notes, even as African countries end up with less notes and more coins. You see, interest is a bread and butter of banking. Without interest, banks would collapse as the bank of banks and the big bulls of global cash, IMF and World Bank, also need the interest payments from Africa to survive. But here's the crazy thing. Over the last 60 years, after lending African countries hundreds, if not thousands of loans, IMF and World Bank have gotten richer, even as Africa has gotten poorer. These two institutions have earned billions of dollars from Africa's interest payments alone. They have become like drugs that provide a temporary high only to plunge Africa deep into the abyss of debt, which is why Africans are now fed up and are demanding immediate radical change of IMF and World Bank. We want to make sure that BRICS is strengthened and BRICS is an alternative to Europe and America. In the wake of World War II, the Bretton Woods institutions, comprising IMF and World Bank, were established to stabilize a world emerging from the ashes of conflict. However, decades later, these institutions stand as bastions of an outdated order, perpetuating a cycle of dependency and inequity that stifles the potential of developing nations, particularly Africa. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, has recently called for significant reforms in the IMF and World Bank. He has denounced IMF and World Bank's pandemic response as a glaring failure that plunged many countries deeper into debt. This critique, resonating with voices from the global south, demands immediate transformative action. Here are three compelling reasons why Africa must urgently push for these reforms. And failing that, consider a unified withdrawal from these two institutions. Firstly, the architecture of the IMF and World Bank is rooted in a post-war reality where many African nations were still under colonial Brothers and sisters. This structure inherently favors wealthy nations with decision-making power concentrated in the hands of the few. The president of the World Bank is traditionally a U.S. national appointed by the U.S. president. Okay, President Biden announced that the United States is nominating RJ Banga to be president of the World Bank. And the IMF's managing director is a European Union national chosen by the European Commission. European Union governments have chosen Kristalina Georgieva from Bulgaria as their candidate to lead the International Monetary Fund. This power dynamics ensures that policies and priorities of these two institutions reflect the interests of their powerful patrons and not the needs of developing nations. Clearly, this system breaks bias and injustice. It was designed in an era where African voices were marginalized completely, if hard at all. Today, this legacy persists with African countries holding only a tiny percentage of voting rights in both IMF and World Bank. This disproportionate influence means that the policies imposed often exacerbate economic disparities in Africa rather than alleviate them. For Africa to break free from this cycle, the decision-making process must be democratized, granting equal representation and influence to all member states.
Secondly, the IMF and World Bank's systemic failures have proved to be a lethal virus that has greatly weakened Africa. The COVID-19 pandemic served as a stress test for global financial institutions and the IMF and World Bank failed spectacularly. During the crisis, wealthy nations received the lion's share of IMF resources. The group of seven nations, with a population of 772 million, were allocated $280 billion, while the least developed countries, home to 1.1 billion people, received a meager $8 billion. How now? This disparity underscores a fundamental flaw in the allocation of resources. The needs of the poorest and most vulnerable are systematically deprioritized by these two institutions. This skewed distribution is not just a technical oversight. It is a moral failure. Africa now spends more on debt servicing than on healthcare, forcing governments to choose between repaying debts or keeping their own citizens alive through better health care. This untenable situation has been exacerbated by rising inflation, increased interest rates, and stagnant debt relief. The IMF and World Bank must overhaul their funding mechanisms to prioritize humanitarian needs and sustainable development over the financial interests of the richest nations. Thirdly, Africa must demand financial sovereignty and craft new alliances that will enable this sovereignty. The Bretton Woods institutions' response to Africa's crises has consistently been top-down with policies dictated by distant bureaucracies rather than tailored to local realities. This approach has not only failed to foster genuine development but has also stimulated the continent's financial sovereignty. The conditionalities attached to the IMF and World Bank loans often compel African nations to implement austerity measures, privatize public assets, and liberalize economies in ways that are often detrimental to local industries and social welfare. In the face of these challenges, Africa must assert its right to chart its own economic path. This could mean forming new alliances and seeking alternative sources of funding that respect the continent's autonomy and developmental priorities. True sovereignty will come from building robust self-sustaining economies that are not overly reliant on external debt. The call for reform of the IMF and World Bank is not just a plea for fairness, it is a demand for survival and dignity. As Antonio Guterres and numerous other critics have pointed out, the current international financial architecture is a relic of a bygone era that perpetuates inequality and stifles growth. If these two institutions cannot adapt to meet the needs of the 21st century, Africa must seriously consider withdrawing en masse and forging a new path. The stakes are high and the time for half measures has passed. Africa's future cannot be mortgaged to institutions that have consistently failed to deliver equitable and effective support. The continent must demand nothing less than a complete overhaul of the IMF and World Bank, one that places the needs of the many above the interests of the few.